Modern Love the Podcast is made possible with support from Living Proof. Everyone's hair is unique. Find your best hair at livingproof.com by taking a quiz to get your perfect mix of product. Use the code LOVE at livingproof.com for a free travel size dry shampoo with your $20 order. We are the science. You are the living proof. And by Squarespace. Love can present challenges, but being modern with a website of your own can be easy with Squarespace. Start a free trial today and use their templates to express yourself. Go to squarespace.com and enter offer code MODERNLOVE to get 10% off your first purchase. From the New York Times and WBUR Boston, this is Modern Love. Stories of love, loss, and redemption. I'm your host, Meghna Chakrabarty. The right person is worth waiting for. But how do you know who the right one is? And how long are you supposed to wait? Sometimes you just have to live and learn, as Hannah Selinger can attest. Here's Thaisa Farmiga, known for roles in FX's American Horror Story and the film The Bling Ring, reading Hannah's essay, Friends Without Benefits. I met him when I was 22 and squandering a year of my life and liver quality, working as a waitress in my Massachusetts hometown. I was an Ivy League graduate who'd always had a plan, and suddenly I had no plan. All my life I had been regimented, disciplined, and very, very good, but I didn't want to be that girl in the front row raising my hand with the right answers anymore. So I traded in my sharpened pencils for an apron and a pair of clogs and started serving tables five nights a week at a local pub. It took a lot less time than anyone expected for me to shed my preppy college ways and adopt the freewheeling lifestyle of restaurant work. The guys in the kitchen labeled me Columbia, an homage to my now distant-seeming academic career. My Massachusetts accent returned with a vengeance, and I learned to negotiate the distance between a post-work six-pack of Bud Light and the crooked mile-long drive home, as all local drunks inevitably do. He had worked at the pub through high school, then returned when, one semester short of graduating from college, he dropped out. He was two years older than me and possessed the kind of natural good looks that made me nervous. I was surprised when he wanted to be friends and opened up his life to me on a boozy and parliament-fueled night in his apartment. But I was not surprised that someone as good-looking as he was chose not to kiss me when the evening ended. We carried on a knotted-up friendship for two years. We shared a bed many times, but never touched. He pulled me into his world only to discard me any night a pretty young thing showed up for the taking, knowing, I think, that I had fallen in love with him and that I was only waiting for him to realize I had been there all along. For those years, we practically lived together. Our friendship was of the riotous, fight-it-out variety, so much so that people often said we were in love. If he was in love with me, he didn't exactly show it spiriting off one night to sleep with my best friend behind my back and asking my roommate to be his date to a wedding we both attended. But I was consumed by him. I had forgotten how to breathe on my own. We circled each other constantly, picking up the messes, piecing our friendship and whatever else remained back together. He knew I loved him. I slept with his cousin to get his attention. And afterward, he looked at me in the sly way of men who know they have you under their thumb, who know you can do nothing to resist. Good for you, he said. That could have been our mantra. Good for you. Years later, he would confess to having loved me all along. But while I stood waiting for him to happen to me, he was always looking for the next best thing. I apparently made too good of a friend for him to justify anything more significant, which my young brain could only interpret as a criticism. To me, it felt like a matter of time. He would come around. I pushed hard against the girls he brought home. I slept on his couch and in the morning shouldered angrily past blonde college students who did not understand my rage. Who was I anyway? A friend? A roommate? A drunken neighbor with nowhere to sleep? Did even I know who I was? 
One night, he and I finally crossed that boundary he had so carefully maintained between us. It was in January, a few years after we met, and I had moved to Boston to go to graduate school. I remember a cold night and the unexpectedness of our coming together, and the quiet of the house, and the light from a neighboring street lamp filtering into the bedroom. I remember how fast my heart was beating, and how I could not seem to catch my breath. There he was, in my bed like old times, but it wasn't platonic anymore. And suddenly there were a million questions we needed to ask. It was perfect and crazy, and it changed us, and I thought the roller coaster had finally ended, that we could settle down together at last. He confessed that he had loved me the whole time, but had been afraid of the intimacy shared between people who know each other so well. When the first light crept in, demanding our attention of this most recent entanglement, he kissed me and left. Later, he called to say that he loved me and that it was a mistake. We talked for what felt like forever, circling the same question, what are we? He wanted nothing, and I wanted the world. I stayed there all weekend, unable to move, paralyzed by the knowledge that now it was over. Even our friendship was too damaged to repair. This is what happens, I learned, when happily ever after does not happen. I moved to New York City that spring. He met another girl he loved, one that probably knew him a little less well. They married two years ago, but I wasn't invited. When I saw him after the fact, he told me not to take it personally, but we both knew that with another twist of fate, it could have been us up there at the altar. I couldn't help but take it personally. It's always personal. From time to time, I would see him at parties and be reminded of what was missing, the hole he left behind. Even less frequently, he would call on a cold winter evening with a set of stock apologies, possibly ignited by a fight he was having with someone else. He knew he had hurt me, and he knew how deeply. One of the worst things I ever did in my life was make that phone call, he told me once, even after he had married, but there was no time to excavate such deep and abiding wounds. When he and his wife had a baby last year, I knew he was gone forever. In the way that you feel the trajectory of life changing, even when you want it most to stay the same, Then a month ago, my phone rang. It was him, a voice still familiar and all too lost in the shape of my daily life. Why call now, I wondered, though I already knew. His wife was leaving him, he said. He needed to talk. I found myself back home for a weekend, walking a hurricane-ravaged beach with no shoes next to this man I had loved so much, listening to him talk about the dissolution of a marriage. He wanted advice and would listen to anything, and it would have been easy to send him toward the certain precipice of divorce, given our history. But instead, I stayed silent and watched the uneven motion of the waves, gray matter shaken from the storm. We followed the crescent of sand for miles before he took my hand. Soon we were back at my mother's house and the guest suite downstairs in love again, though only for a moment. I had to close my eyes to kiss him because otherwise I could not convince myself after all those years that this was really happening. I couldn't fall asleep in his arms. What would happen, I'm sure we were both asking ourselves, when the days continued on, him here or me there, with the wife and a baby still in the wings? What good could come from any of this now, really? The gesture's futile. The pain so deeply embedded that I am prone to always making the same mistakes. <sighs> I'm messed up, he said, hoping, I think, that I would come back and save him the way I always had before. Put him first, choose him over me, allow his immediacy to overshadow my own. Yes, I said. Yes, you are. I put on a sweater. I went outside with him for a parting cigarette and kissed him goodbye in the forgiving October air. We had met in October, too, and at once it seemed like a very long time ago, and only a whisper, like all time, really. At 32, I finally did what I could not all those years ago. I let him go.
Lisa Farmiga reading Hannah Selinger's essay, Friends Without Benefits. Did Hannah truly let him go? We'll find out after the break. Support for Modern Love, the podcast, comes from Living Proof, the science behind healthy hair. I'm Katie from Living Proof, and we get love letters all the time, like this one. Dear Living Proof, after reading one of my favorite blogger's reviews, I bought your no-frizz line for my fried colored hair. My verdict? Living Proof is amazeballs. I can't explain it. Where has this been all my life? I am an LP lifer. Love, Gloria. Use the code LOVE for a free, travel-sized dry shampoo with your $20 order. Livingproof.com. We're back. It's Modern Love, the podcast. I'm Meghna Chakrabarty. And now a postscript from Modern Love editor Daniel Jones and the author of this week's essay, Hannah Selinger. I wish I could say for the symmetry of the piece that I wrote and for maybe my heart that where the story physically ends was the physical end to my relationship with the subject. But in truth, we did have one more romantic encounter. We were friends after that, and then for a long period of time, we were not friends when the piece came out in the Times. As it happens, his divorce was finalized literally the week before this piece came out. So I think he was particularly sensitive to just all of it. I I think it packed an emotional punch for him. We've sort of been on and off as far as communication goes for the past couple of years. I guess we've both allowed the relationship to go by the wayside. But... I'm of the belief that, you know, some friendships grow with you and some friendships don't, and and I'm okay with however it ends up. Hannah's essay is the story of the friendship that you are afraid to turn into a relationship. But I also like about Hannah's essay just how much time passes where this guy remains the one who got away. You know, his life goes on and he marries someone else and he has a family and All this time she's thinking, should that have been me? And I'm always intrigued by how that spell gets broken. It's so easy to keep that romantic fantasy in your mind as long as you're not with the person. But as soon as you reconnect and are sort of reminded of uh, why it didn't work out in the first place, that spell gets broken and you're released. How you know something is over is is really more of a gut reaction than anything else. For me, I think I woke up at some point and decided that I had to stop chasing things that were just unavailable. And I had a pattern of relationship that I was used to, and I had a pattern of relationship that was comfortable for me. And psychologically, I think it was both rewarding and unrewarding. You know, the chase was interesting, the pursuit was consuming, but in the end, I never really got what I wanted. And I did it over and over and over again, um, which I guess is the definition of insanity, right? But um, I think with him, when things finally drew to a close after really a decade, it occurred to me that there was probably a better way to go about all of this. I mean, I think this essay is, is a real lesson in when you really need to stand your ground and insist that a relationship be defined When both people in the relationship are afraid to define it, they don't know who they are in relationship to each other, which both prevents them from calling the relationship anything, but also prevents it from ending because there's nothing to end. It really represents a kind of relationship that that happens so much these days, especially with people in their 20s who uh, don't feel like they're ready for that big commitment and don't know if this is the right person but don't want to let go either because they might be. So it just lingers in this nether world of what are we to each other. But Hannah didn't linger for too much longer. In the three years since her piece was published, she's moved to the Hamptons on New York's Long Island, where she's a sommelier and a freelance writer. She lives there with her boyfriend and their three dogs, and they have a baby on the way. Hannah says her current relationship taught her a lot about what was missing before. I certainly wouldn't want to tell someone not to wait around, but my experience has been now that I'm in the best relationship of my life and we're having a child together and moving forward with our lives in a very positive and aspirational way, 
that there wasn't one second in my current relationship where I felt like I had to wait around. There wasn't a minute from the beginning until now where I felt like he didn't want to be with me. And I hope that everybody can find that kind of thing, and I do believe that it exists. Once you experience that kind of relationship and that kind of love, you realize that you shouldn't be waiting around for anybody. Hannah Selinger, author of Friends Without Benefits. We also heard from Modern Love editor Daniel Jones. And now we want to hear from you. Have you ever waited for love? Did it end happily? Or was it time wasted? What did you learn from it all? Tell us in 30 seconds or less. Record a voice memo on your phone and email it to modernlove at wbur.org. Again, that's modernlove at wbur.org. Special thanks to Thaisa Farmiga for reading this week's essay. You can see her later this year opposite Ethan Hawke and John Travolta in the film In a Valley of Violence. Next week on Modern Love... I loved how he admired my long hair and subtle décolletage, how he laughed at my witty banter. I felt like a femme fatale, and I liked it. Nothing serious, nothing permanent. We were there for the fun. Katie Couric reads a story of a woman in a relationship built on looks, or so she thought. Modern Love is a production of The New York Times and WBUR, Boston's NPR station. It is produced, directed, and edited by Jessica Alpert, John Parati, and Amory Sievertson. The idea for the Modern Love podcast was conceived by Lisa Tobin. Our casting consultant is Amy Lippins. Iris Adler is our executive producer. Daniel Jones is editor of Modern Love for The New York Times and advisor to the show. Music for the podcast, courtesy of APM. I'm Meghna Chakrabarty. We'll see you next week.